name was Raed Fares, one of the original pro-democracy activists in Syria. قتل النشط الإعلامي رائد الفارس مع صديقه وزميله and one of two activists shot dead by government. He warned that without voices like Radio Rush, another generation would take up arms. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. Here are some of the media stories that we're covering this week. In Syria, journalism and activism both take a hit with the murder of someone who did both, Raed Fares. Former collaborators no longer on the best of terms. The Guardian and Julian Assange are going at it once again. Bordering on propaganda, the TV shows that are monetizing migrants and smugglers. And what would Jesus do if he was an evangelical American? Biblical talking points updated for 2018. One soul for the whole world, that is an amazing deal. Seven years into the war in Syria, with all the state and non-state actors who have become part of that story, it's easy to forget how it all began. With an uprising, a people's rebellion against an authoritarian government, a fight for democracy and a free media. Raed Fares was one of the figureheads of that movement until he was shot dead last week alongside his cameraman, probably by fighters linked to al-Qaeda. Fares used various forms of media, especially radio, to push a revolutionary agenda from the town of Kafran Bel in the rebel-held province of Idlib. Five years ago, he started organizing protests there and came up with innovative ways to call out the hypocrisy of the West. He riffed on news coverage he disapproved of. He focused on the suffering of ordinary Syrians. With Assad and his backers still largely in control, some see the killing of Fares as symbolic, the extinguishing of any remaining hope that the values of the Arab Spring can live on in Syria. Our starting point this week is the town where Raed Fares lived and died, the one he put on the map, Kafran Bel. Raed was a one-man revolution. He did it all, but he specialized in the media. He excelled there. He was a pioneer. He may not have been a professional journalist, but he did what you could call alternative media. He is impossible to replace. Raed Fahed's story reflects the path of the Syrian uprising. Firstly, this massive protest movement challenging a notoritarian, despotic uh, Assad regime. And Raed Fares uh, represented the dynamic of this protest movement. The first wave of protest leaders uh, were either dead, they had disappeared in, in jail somewhere, or they had fled the country to seek safety in exile. But Raed Fares was one of the few who remained in his country and who continued his work from inside Syria and he paid with his life for that activism. In most places, straddling the line between journalism and activism is problematic. Objectivity can suffer. Audiences don't really know what they're getting. And calling the late Raed Fares a journalist would be inaccurate. There was too much activism in the work he did. However, that's an ethical issue for outsiders to ponder. Inside Syria, more than seven years into this war, such a debate would feel like a luxury, an indulgence. One of the most important aspects of media work in the Syrian revolution is this blurring of boundaries between journalism, activism, art making and human rights work. When you are in a very dark, difficult situation where your survival cannot be taken for granted, you're not as concerned with a sort of a strictly, narrowly defined journalism uh, focused on impartiality, on, on basic facts, as finding out how to survive and helping other people get information that helps them survive. And Raed, in that sense, was what I called um, a creative insurgent, right? He was an exemplary creative insurgent. Well, Raed Ferris didn't hide the fact uh, that he was an activist. He didn't hide his views or his political slant. On the contrary, uh, he and his colleagues shared their messages in bright colors on white fabric banners and in biting cartoons and video skits. So, uh, you know, that was very clear where he was coming from. And they also spared no one. Their uh, messages were directed against the Assad regime. They were also directed against 
the Syrian political opposition exile, the foreign backers of both the rebels and uh, the Assad government, as well as the Islamists who came to have increasing power in Kiframbil and other parts of Idlib where Ra'id was based. Ra'ed Fares started to make his mark in the Syrian media space in 2013, two years after the war broke out. At the time, Syrians in search of news were relying on TV channels coming out of Damascus, controlled by the Assad government, and pan-Arab news networks, some of which had their own dogs in the fight. Fares's contribution to a media landscape that was mostly high-tech the TV news channels beaming in via satellite, the bloggers spreading information and misinformation over the web, was tactically low-tech. The channel he helped create was called Radio Fresh. Riot Fires and his team established Radio Fresh in 2013. This was a way to promote uh, different democratic ideals, women's role in society, challenging conservative traditional ideas as well. And it was very important to have an independent media to show uh, the message of the people, what they were struggling for against uh, the regime, but also from the Western or uh, Gulf uh, medias that had their own agenda. So it was very important to, sh to have an independent uh, media instrument from the ground. Radio is very easy to transmit and very easy to listen to. Radio also can give you minute by minute uh, very specific micro-local information that in some cases can be life-saving. So for example, you can uh, learn that uh, Jabhat al-Nusra in Syria has set up a checkpoint and they're looking for activists that they're kidnapping uh, at that crossing. And so activists know not to drive or not to walk that way at that moment. And that's crucially important. So radio is crucial here, and the decision to use radio, I think, was brilliant. Ra'ed Fares also knew his audiences. His messages to the outside world, pleas for help, were in English, splashed on banners, telegenic, and designed for export via someone else's camera. Radio Fresh broadcasts in Arabic to local listeners. No one has claimed responsibility for Ferez's murder, but Hayat et Tahrir al Sham, a fundamentalist group in control of Kafran Bell, a former affiliate of Al Qaeda, is among the suspects. Extremist groups had attacked the station before. They opposed its output and would have disapproved of the way Radio Fresh was funded. The station was launched with the help of U.S. State Department dollars, and the U.S. continued to bankroll it until the Trump administration halted the funding earlier this year. Accepting uh, foreign support uh, in the form of money, of equipment, of technical expertise is an extremely difficult question. And here's the logic, a small uh, group of people trying to survive extremely violent conflict. On the other side, we have a well-equipped regime that's using planes and barrel bombs and even chemical weapons in some cases. It's supported by, by Russia and Iran. What can I do if I'm desperate? It becomes very difficult not to accept any aid. Everybody in Syria was backed by somebody, but that didn't necessarily mean that they bought them, that those patrons had bought them ideologically. And Ra'ad Ferris before the U.S. State Department funding was the same as Ra'ad Ferris after the U.S. State Department funding. But the U.S. funding etched, if you like, the bullseye that was already in Ra'ad Ferris's back, and it made it easier for some of his critics to uh, claim that he was a U.S. stooge or doing the U.S.'s bidding. Before the war began, Ra'ad Fares wasn't even a journalist, nor was he an activist. He worked in real estate while studying to be a doctor. He brought to journalism the zeal of a convert, and his commitment did not wane. Unlike so many Syrian activists who became targets, he did not leave the country to continue his work in exile, although no one would have blamed him if he had. He stayed, knowing that decision could cost him his life. His voice has been silenced, but the station he helped create remains on the air, reporting the news to the people of Kafranda. Ra'id Khan. Ra'id Faris was an ideal. For seven or eight years, Ra'id worked to establish a moral and principled foundation for the revolution and to promote freedom of thought and expression. He is impossible to replace. We will continue his work and carry forward his message. 
but free Syria has lost one of her greatest sons, Ra'id Faris. We're discussing other media stories that are on our radar this week with one of our producers, Minakshi Ravi. Mina, last week we reported on the accidental revelation from the U.S. Department of Justice that it's prepared an indictment against the founder of WikiLeaks, Julian Assange. This past week, The Guardian also did a piece on Assange and WikiLeaks. What did it report? On the face of it, Richard, The Guardian has an explosive story. It says President Donald Trump's former campaign manager, Paul Manafort, secretly met with Julian Assange at least three times, the last time coming just months before WikiLeaks released those hacked Democratic Party emails in 2016. Now, you put these details together with previously leaked communications between Assange and the Trump family, and it reinforces the story of collaboration between the two. And since cybersecurity firms have said the emails were hacked by Russian intelligence groups, this report also goes to the allegations of collusion and Russian interference in the U.S. elections. But the article provides no evidence of what it calls the apparent meetings. It cites anonymous sources only. And the visitor records at the Ecuadorian embassy in London, where Assange has lived for the past six years, reportedly show no logs of such meetings. Not the kind of story WikiLeaks would take lying down. How has it responded to this report? With guns blazing, basically. It tweeted that it was willing to bet The Guardian a million dollars and its editor's head that Manafort never met Assange and said it was going to sue The Guardian for libel. It also tracks some changes The Guardian made to the article. The original headline was categorical, and then it was changed to attribute the story to sources. News outlets don't like to amend headlines like that in public. It's not a good look. And one of the story's co-authors, Luke Harding, has been widely criticized for his past reporting of Assange for having some kind of ax to grind. Moving on to a television channel in Poland that's been accused of spreading Nazi propaganda after it broadcast a story that it said exposed a neo-Nazi group. What's going on there? The broadcaster is TVN, one of Poland's most widely watched commercial channels, owned by the U.S. media company Discovery. Now, this past January, TVN aired an investigative report about members of a neo-Nazi group which calls itself Pride and Modernity. After it was broadcast, some pro-government media suggested TVN had staged the report. And this past week, the reporter Piotr Wutsowski was summoned by security services to answer questions about, quote, propagating Nazism. Now, the state prosecutor dropped the case after a huge backlash, though it has directed a regional prosecutor to carry on the investigation. In a statement, TVN said, putting someone who reveals criminal activity on the same level as the criminals is an attempt to intimidate journalists. Now, this isn't the first time TVN has had a run-in with Polish authorities. It was fined last year for supposed biased coverage of anti-government protests. That fine was eventually waived, but the message had already been sent both to the channel and other outlets in the country. Okay. Thanks, Mina. They are images seen on screen more and more often. Border control officials searching for illegal goods, interrogating unwanted newcomers, demanding to see their documents, deporting those deemed undesirable, all in the name of protecting the homeland. And those pictures don't just end up on newscasts. Border security programs are now a subgenre of reality television. Producers say the shows provide an insight into the essential work of customs and immigration agencies. But in the post-9-11 climate and in the context of a global refugee surge, the format smacks of tabloid TV at its worst, often exaggerating and sensationalizing the threats posed by those crossing the border. For governments with law and order policies to sell, these shows are like paid political advertising without the paid part. For broadcasters, it's television made on the cheap. Never mind that those tuning in at home might be left with a distorted view of what really happens at their nation's borders. The Listening Post's Johanna Hoos now on the dangers of border security TV. Border Force, America's gatekeepers. These are the gatekeepers of the most talked about border in the world. Border security, Australia's front line. And immigration detains a busload of illegal workers. Border Patrol New Zealand, 
immigration screen and profile for undesirable and unsuitable arrivals. Just some of the border security TV shows currently on air around the world. We're in a time where immigration is uh, increasingly part of popular discourse and anti-immigration discourse is increasingly part of popular culture. So the idea that we need to shut down our borders, that quote unquote illegal immigration is changing our culture and our demographics. And so border security shows really appeal to people's desires to control borders. These shows don't exist in a vacuum. Um, and I think you just need to look at the sort of language that's used around immigration. Certainly in, in the Australian example, the show is called Border Force, Australia's front line. I mean, front line is a militaristic term. It's something you associate with, with war and with conflict. And I think that, that really sets the tone for what we're talking about. The format is simple and it's cheap. Crews get behind the scenes, accompanying border security as they search for illegal goods, interrogate the suspicious and deport the unwanted. And CBSA officers want to know who's coming to play and who's coming to stay. Border crossings and airport service filming locations, while shows like Australia's Frontline or Border Patrol New Zealand also feature raids on migrant workers or visa overstayers, those have already made it into the country. At an early morning roadside operation, immigration suspect they have caught this Indonesian man working illegally. Japan's recently premiered Taikyo no Shunkan, or caught at the moment of deportation, ramped up that drama. It follows a group of immigration officers in their hunt for so-called illegal aliens. The broadcast has faced a lot of critique for its lack of balance and for turning the perils of immigration into entertainment. One of the problems with programs like Caught at the moment of deportation is that there's no journalistic rigor. It looks journalistic because you're with the officers, with your camera, so you as the viewer can feel you can judge what's happening, but we don't actually talk to the other side. In one segment, Tokyo immigration officers stake out an apartment building. The police officers enter the apartment and they find three Vietnamese guest workers. They interrogate them uh, on camera, and then the next day they are deported. We tend to think that they're guilty, but there's been no due process. It seems like mission accomplished. Good job, police. The shows do make good TV, but in order to do that, they need to sensationalise and exaggerate the idea of a threat at our borders. New Zealand's air, sea, and land borders are constantly under attack. These shows do give the impression that, that countries are under siege from overwhelming numbers of people seeking to break laws and flout regulations. That could destroy our economy and our whole way of life. What they don't show, because it doesn't make good TV, is the tens of thousands, in fact hundreds of thousands of people who pass through borders legitimately every day. Stuart Morris is the executive producer of Border Force, America's Gatekeepers a show originally produced for British broadcaster UK TV, but since sold to National Geographic for American audiences. The 10-part series follows the Department of Homeland Security's Customs and Border Protection Agency, CBP, and their operations at the bridges that connect the US and Mexico. Morris calls his show an observational documentary and dispute the idea that border control shows misrepresent the threats posed by those crossing the border. We're recording things which would happen even if our cameras aren't there. It's, it is truly a kind of a fly on the wall, OBS doc series, watching from the point of view of Customs and Border Protection officers. Lately, there's been a trend on people trying to smuggle narcotics on this type of bottles. One of the problems that we had is that we had a small crew covering 28 bridges. There was a drug bust on a daily basis, but some of them happened 300 miles from where we were at that time and we couldn't film it. If we had a crew in every bridge, we would show the true extent of the problems that officers face. So I think we kind of got a really good, a fair reflection of what they do and how they operate. For critics, the issues go beyond the narratives that these shows create, such as casting border security officials as the good guys. The program Border Security, Canada's Frontline is a textbook case of that syndrome, or at least it was. According to a study conducted by a group that campaigned for the cancellation of the show, in most episodes, more suspects were deemed guilty based on the color of their skin. 
and producers turned the migrants involved into unwitting actors. One migrant worker, Oscar Mata Duran, sued the program in 2013 for breach of privacy. Duran's workplace was raided by the Border Security Agency and his deportation was filmed and prepared for broadcast. But Duran won his case. In 2016, the show was cancelled and the episode never went to air. During the course of that uh, raid, we got calls from family members to say, you know, help us get our family members out of detention. And during the course of that conversation, a number of family members said there was massive film crews. And through that, we realized that, you know, basically Canada Border Security was trying to film a very sensationalist raid. And during the course of talking to the men who were in detention, we found out that Oscar Mata Duran, as well as a number of other workers, signed consent forms to be on this TV show. And this generated a massive campaign against the TV show um, on the basis that people's privacy rights were being violated, that people were not able to give informed consent, that deportation was being used as entertainment. The criticism of Canada's front line went far beyond Oscar Mata Durant's case. The show's production company, Force 4, got a helping hand from the government in the form of subsidies and they agreed to surrender editorial control of the program to the Border Protection Agency. It's the price that the producers paid in exchange for access, and they aren't the only ones to do so. In the cases of, of Australia, investigations have uncovered that the Immigration Department, the, the, the Department of Border Security, has final sign-off on every single program that goes to where and is able to manipulate the show to its own ends. These are, for all intents and purposes, government propaganda. This is not to suggest that what's happening is not the reality of what's happening, but it is, it is a prejudiced and distorted view of, of, of that reality. The uh, authorities in Australia had a little bit too much control and um, I think that's unfortunate especially if other shows are tarnished with that. I mean, we signed a, a multimedia agreement with Homeland Security, which is very non-restrictive. They have no editorial control over what we put out. But I think what they get out of it is they inform the public through a process which is accessible. And, you know, members of the public aren't, aren't going to watch some corporate video about, you know, CBP, but they might actually watch a show about the Southwest border and the work that CBP does, told in a kind of independent, way by independent producers. It's essentially free PR in prime time and it's syndicated into to reruns so it's great. I mean you, you invest a little bit of time by allowing a camera crew to accompany and you've got an hour-long commercial for the great things your government's doing. Commercial in more ways than one. A free advert for the agencies being profiled, a TV hit that's affordable for those producing it. But what about the bits that don't make the cut? The crucial backstories of the lives ruined that just don't make for good television. Perhaps at a time of unprecedented displacement, audiences should be more discriminating over border control TV, programming that clearly crosses the line. And finally, a few weeks back, we did a piece on CBN, the biggest Christian broadcaster in the U.S., and how the network still supports Donald Trump, despite the president's palpable lack of piety. A small American production company called Friend Dog Studios has gone over some of that same ground, how U.S. evangelicals and so many Republicans can somehow square Trump's behavior, his politics, with biblical teachings. Christians sometimes ask themselves, what would Jesus do? The following video suggests a few things that Jesus might say about some of today's more contentious social and political issues, such as immigration and health care, if, that is, Jesus was a Republican. Hence, the video's title, GOP Jesus. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Truly, I say unto you, whoever welcomes one of these little ones in my name might be letting in a murderer or a drug. Let's get her to a detention center. You know, so we can figure out what's going on. What is a man profited if he gain the whole world but lose his soul? A lot, he has profited a lot. One soul for the whole world, that is an amazing deal. If a man strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him and shoot him. That is the law. You have heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you, any man who looks upon a woman with lust in his heart 
should go ahead and do what he's got to do. Rabbi, Rabbi, surely you can heal me. My child, of course I could. But who would pay for it? What? I don't understand. I don't have any money. Yes, it is a sad story, but it does not make me responsible. Uh.